Leslie here, Jeremy Jenko, and today I'm talking to someone with a surname as interesting as my own, Dr. Nathan Jankowski <laughs> from the University of Wollongong. Nathan is a geologist who is part of a team doing research at the site where Mungo Man and Lady were found. Hi, Nathan. Hello. <laughs> Can you please explain who Mungo Man and who Mungo Man? is and why his discovery is so important. So Mungo Man uh, is the remains of um, Australia's probably oldest Aboriginal uh, burial. He was discovered out at Lake Mungo at, um, in the, the 1970s and at that point in time people thought that the, the First Nation people of Australia were only here for about 20,000 years. However, Dating of the skeleton and also the sediment surrounding him have shown that he actually lived about 42,000 years ago. So that one discovery effectively doubled the length of time that we, at that point in time, understood Aboriginal Australians to have lived in Australia. Recent uh, research in uh, the Northern Territory has actually shown that Aboriginal people here have actually been here as long as 65,000 years. So we are constantly pushing that, that timeline backwards. So he was really important because he basically revolutionised what we understood about people living here on the Australian continent. Have scientists worked out yet how Mungo Man died? Uh, from what I understand, no. So we believe he probably died of natural causes. We do know that he had um, arthritis, uh, but he was a very tall individual as well. So I can't actually comment too much more because I don't know too much more about how he actually died. How do you pronounce the period of time in history where Mungo Man, when Mungo Man lived? And what would it have been like then? Okay, so the period of time that Mungo Man lived in is called the Pleistocene period. Um, sounds like Pleistocene, but it's got nothing to do with it. Um, basically, when Mungo Man was alive at about 42,000 years ago, you're effectively on the other side of the last ice age. So conditions were a little cooler than what they are now. On average, probably about four degrees colder. Um, at that point in time, the lake out at Mungo, where we found Mungo Man, was full of water and at present is completely dry and has been that way for about 15,000 years. So the semi-arid interior of Australia at that point in time we think actually had a lot more water in it than what it currently does when you imagine what the middle of Australia looks like usually. It's sort of dry and barren and nothing's growing. But back then there was actually a lot of water in the landscape so it would have been lush and green and lots of animals and things around for people to, to hunt and eat. Um, also, at that point in time, we also had the last of Australia's megafauna in the landscape. So these were large bodied mammals and birds, um, basically like giant wombats and kangaroos. So the largest wombat was sort of the size of a Volkswagen <laughs> beetle, um, whereas the large sort of kangaroos and things were, you know, two metres tall. Um, I think my favourite is probably the genuinus, which is a, a huge sort of um, emu, sort of like a duck, but um, very large duck, <laughs> two and a half metres tall. <laughs> what are you and your team trying to discover or understand at Lake Mungo? So Lake Mungo is an important site because uh, unlike other places in Australia, we actually have a pretty continuous record of people living in that landscape from about 50,000 years ago all the way through to the present. So what we're trying to actually do is through the material culture that has been left behind, so the stone tools, the, the, um, the cooking fires, the, the, the formal remains of what people were eating, to figure out what people were actually doing back then because the interesting thing is that the landscape hasn't remained the same. I've just talked to you about the fact that the lake used to be full and there used to be lots of water and lots of animals around. That was, wasn't always the case. So as you decline in 
uh, down into the cold, sort of harsh wastes of the last ice age in Australia. You have really cold climatic conditions out there, and people are actually living in some of the worst <laughs> like climatic conditions going. So six degrees colder than what it is today. Um, the fact that your lake and your water source is running out because it's the lake levels going down at that point in time. Um, people are living out in the landscape and they're surviving very well. They, they, they're just very resilient because they adapt to what's going on around them and they target different things to help them get through the tough periods. How do you scientists studying Lake Mungo and the artifacts work out what happened so long ago? Can you please explain the science? So, there's probably two different prongs to that question because there's what the archaeologists do and then there's what I do. So, the archaeologists look at the material culture that people left behind. So basically it's the things that people couldn't be bothered taking with them. So, it's the fireplaces that they construct, it's the, the meals that are left inside the fireplaces. So, uh, for instance, um, we get some fireplaces that are full of shellfish. So people have gone out and collected freshwater mussels from the lake and they've gone up and they've set their fire and they've had a yummy meal of <laughs> shellfish. Um, in other fireplaces we find that people have actually, you know, caught small marsupials. Interestingly, we don't usually get large macropods, so large kangaroos and wallabies aren't usually a target species for what people are actually looking or looking out to hunt for, at least from the evidence that we can find out at Lake Mungo. Um, whereas in contrast, what I'm up to is looking at the landscape. So I'm a geologist, I look at how the landscape's changed over time. Um, and we do that through looking at how the sediment, so the dirt that makes up the landscape out there, changes as you move through different layers. Um, we can actually date individual sand grains from those layers and get a pretty good idea of how long ago it was that they were actually blown up and formed the, the dune that surrounds Lake Mungo where all the archaeology is actually found. So the stories that we can tell out there are sort of two two simultaneous sort of things happening at the same time. It's what people were doing in that landscape, but also how the landscape is changing alongside that. And then we marry those two things together and see how people's strategies change over time as a result of changing landscape conditions. Do you work with the traditional owners when you're doing your field work? Yes. <laughs> um, none of the work that we do out at Lake Mungo actually would be done without the support and permission of the traditional owner groups that are part of um, the Aboriginal Advisory Group that oversees what goes on at Mungo. So everything that we do basically gets run past the advisory group beforehand. Um, and then while we're actually out doing field work, we also have representatives from each of the three uh, tribal groups come and take part in what we're up to as well. So there's three traditional groups out there. They are the Barkindji, the Mari Mari and the Niampa. And they all collectively work together to oversee the running of the World Heritage Area. And also the activities, whether it's scientific, cultural, tourist, you name it. Um, they all work together to oversee how, how to manage the landscape, um, both now and also moving forward into the future. So, uh, Mungo Man was discovered in the early 1970s um, and as I said before he was removed from country without permission of the traditional owners. Um, he spent the next 40 odd years uh, at the Australian National Museum, uh, the Australian National University. However, the the traditional owner groups at, at Lake Mungo petitioned heavily to have his remains and also the remains of a whole bunch of other people that were removed from country uh, to be returned at the end of last year. So Mungo Man currently made his way back to, to the country that he lived and loved and walked upon 
Um, and he is currently waiting to be reburied in exactly the same way that he was discovered, so that he can be laid to rest and be one with the country once again. I'm comparing and contrasting Mungo Man with Narabean Man, and I've learnt they're both pretty tall like you. How tall are you? I'm 196 centimetres. So. Okay. Well, Narabean Man was 183 centimetres, and Mungo Man was 170 centimetres. First we have Narabean Man, next we have Mungo Man. <laughs> Compared to Mavis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh. And here's me. Dream <laughs> high. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much for sharing your information and knowledge with me today, Nathan. No problem. Thank you yeah. for having me. No, you're welcome. <laughs>